Stick around till the end of this video because I've recorded a song that summarises the key points, but I've also got the help of a very famous voice to do the vocals. I'm sure you'll recognise the voice straight away. I'm DT Mr C and this is Mechanisms number three. <laughs> To start off by talking about gears. Now gears are little wheels with teeth on like that and you can get them in different sizes so there's a small one there and when you put them together the whole point is that those teeth lock together that's called meshing the teeth mesh and what that allows them to do it allows them to cause each other to turn so if I turn the small one now that's causing the bigger one to turn in the opposite direction now this is called a simple gear train. This is also a simple gear train, but instead of having two gears, it's got three. It's got an extra one in the middle. So the input is this one, the one that I'm going to turn. That's the output. And if you notice now that the input and the output go in the same direction, and that's because of the little gear in the middle called the idler gear. Gear ratio is a comparison of how many times each gear completes one full turn, and it depends on how many teeth each of the gears has got. Right, so you've got to be able to calculate gear ratio at GCSE, and there's a formula. It is gear ratio equals the number of teeth on the output, which is a driven, divided by the number of teeth on the input, which is a driver. That's 40 divided by 8, which gives us a ratio of 5 to 1, and you've got to write it like that because it is a ratio. And because the big gear's got five times as many teeth, the small gear needs to turn around five times just for the big gear to turn around once. And this is something else you'll probably have to calculate on GCSE questions. Right, look at the bottom of the gear and I've put a blue mark on with pen. If I turn that round, just imagine I could turn it around really slowly and it took one full minute for that blue mark to get back to the bottom again, then the speed of that gear would be one revolution per minute. If I did it a bit faster, and it went around twice in a minute, I know I'm doing it faster than that, but if it went around twice in a minute like that, and back to the bottom again, that would be a speed of two revolutions per minute. If it's going really, really fast like that, you know, it's like 100 revolutions per minute or something like that. So the higher the revolutions per minute, the faster it's going. We've already looked at a simple gear train. This is when each axle or shaft has only got one gear on it. We've also got something called a compound gear train. The compound gear on this train is the one in the middle because the axle's got two gears on it. It's got a large one, then it's got a smaller one. They rotate at exactly the same speed. So when I turn the input, which is a small one, the output, which is a large one, rotates very, very slowly compared to the input. These gear systems are very, very useful because they allow something that's rotating quickly, like a car engine, to turn it into something which rotates far more slowly. For example, the wheels, the drive wheels of the car. Now you can find gears on all sorts of products. There's gears on bikes and on this tin opener. Have you ever wondered how a car steering mechanism works? Well, it uses a mechanism called the rack and pinion. This is when a round gear connects with a flat one.
so rack and pinion mechanisms can be used on car steering and on sliding things such as gates or doors. Hello! In the Lego model that I've built of the sliding gate, I'm actually turning the input. In reality though, this would probably be a motor that turns it, and the mechanism itself turns rotary motion into linear motion. Another tip for exams here, in questions you will quite often simplify how gears are drawn and just do them as two concentric circles like this. This is because it's a lot easier doing this than drawing all those teeth. The broken lines are there to show where the centres of the gear shafts are and the arrows show what direction the gears rotate in. On the diagram at the top of this page I want you to pay close attention to where the gears actually mesh in the middle. Notice how the different types of line overlap with each other because this shows how the teeth mesh. And similarly you might see a rack and pinion mechanism drawn a little bit like this. Right, we just need to look at another type of gear called a bevel gear. This is where the teeth are actually angled at 45 degrees so that when they interlock they change the direction of motion through 90 degrees. And I've made an actual machine with bevel gears there. You can see the two bevel gears. If I turn this handle, the output rotates. That could be a drill or it could be a hand whisk. If I hold the gears close enough to the camera, hopefully you can see that the teeth are actually angled at 45 degrees each which means that the input direction of rotation there is at 90 degrees to the output there. How do drills work when you switch them on? The drill bit goes in something called a chuck. The chuck is connected to a shaft and the shaft goes up here through the top of the drill and connected to something called a pulley system here, these wheels. Hopefully you can see that if I turn those pulleys by hand Hopefully you can see that the chuck and the drill bit rotate. The drill's actually powered by that motor there at the back, but how does the power from that motor get to the chuck to cause the chuck to rotate? The answer is, it's in the top of the drill in a pulley system there. So the motor, which is just hiding behind there, is connected to this pulley, and that pulley is connected to the pulley system at the front there by means of a belt. So this is called a belt pulley mechanism. So as you can see, the motor turns that, that's connected via this belt to the front one, the front one is connected to the chuck causing it to rotate. The way we've got this set up at the moment is that the belt at the back is on the smallest pulley, but at the front it's on the largest pulley. And what that means is that the motor, which is on this one, is gonna rotate a lot faster than the chuck, which is connected to that one. We could have them the other way around and we could have the pulley on the smallest one at the front and the largest one at the back. What would happen there is that the chuck would then rotate a lot faster than the motor. The belt pulley mechanism is also used to turn the drum of a washing machine. When you look at the back of the washer you'll see that the belt attaches to a small pulley on the motor at the bottom of the picture. But the belt also goes around a much larger pulley at the top which is attached to the drum. What this means is that the motor rotates far faster than the drum. Stick around for the song, bye for now. Gears are little wheels, except they have some teeth. When they connect together, they mesh, that's my belief. Yeehaw! Some gear trains have an idler gear. Use one if you need to change output direction without changing output speed. You can use a rack and pinion to move a sliding gate. Hello. And also for car steering. Ha uh ha, -huh, that's sick mate. Yeehaw. When you turn the little gear, it meshes with the rack and turns rotary to linear to move it along the track. only have one gear on each shaft. Compound gear trains sometimes have two. No, don't be daft. Yeehaw! Bevel gears are often used for changing the direction. Through 90 degrees, it does it with ease. What a useful interconnection. Pulleys are an alternative to transferring rotary motion. You usually connect them together with a belt washing machines to connect the motor to the drum. 
and you can see them in pillar drills if your teacher gets it open. Mm-hmm.